Placement, repair, equipment, use and occupancy, location, maintenance, removal, and demolition of every building or structure or any appurtenances connected or attached to such buildings or structures. The exception from the building code, detached one and two family dwellings and multiple single family dwellings or townhouses, not more than three stories above grade plane in height with a separate means of egress. And their accessory structures not more than three stories above grade plane and height shall comply with international residential code. That's what we use, you know, for just your basic house that you build. So the intent of this code and the reason that we have these codes, the purpose of this code is to establish the minimum requirements to provide a reasonable level of safety, public health, and general welfare through structural strength, means of egress facilities, stability, sanitation, adequate light and ventilation, energy conservation, and safety to life and property from fire and other hazards attributed to the built environment. The most important part of the whole thing here, this next line, to provide a reasonable level of safety to firefighters and emergency responders during emergency operations. So when people say, why do we have to have building codes? Why do I have to have a permit? Why does my building have to be inspected? Because if you make a call to 911, we want those firefighters to be safe when they go in the building to try to get you out. If you build an unsafe structure, you're putting yourself in danger as well as the rest of the people trying to come in and get you. So the reference codes for, for the International Building Code, and I won't read through these, we've got the gas code, mechanical code, plumbing code, property maintenance code, Fire Prevention or the International Fire Code, the Energy Conservation Code, and existing buildings. Now, International Residential Code. The provisions of the IRC for one and two family dwellings shall apply to the construction, operation, movement, enlargement, replacement, repair, equipment, use and occupancy, location, removal, and demolition of detached one and two family dwellings and townhouses not more than three stories above grade plane. 
with a separate, uh, with a separate means of egress and their accessory structures. So you want an accessory structure behind your house? That's fine. It has to be permitted. The intent of this, the purpose of this code is to establish minimum requirements to safeguard the public safety, health and general welfare through affordability, structural strength, means of egress facilities, stability, sanitation, light and ventilation, energy conservation, and safety to life and property from fire and other hazards attributed to the built environment, and then same thing as the other code, to provide safety to firefighters and emergency responders during emergency operations. Existing structures. The legal occupancy of any structure existing on the date of adoption of this code shall be permitted to continue without change. So anything that existed on, on January the 1st, 2018 was good. Then anything on January the 2nd when we started our own building department from that day forward, you know, these 2015 codes apply. So if someone has a structure that they want to use, they've got a house, they've got a house out here that, and, and let's say it's been abandoned for 20 years. If they're going to remodel that house, if they're going to do structural changes, they have to have a building permit. Anything that they do structural wise has to meet current code. We go, go to the next section, additions, alterations, and repairs. Additions, alterations, and repairs to any structure shall conform to the requirements for a new structure without requiring the existing structure to comply with the requirements of this code unless otherwise stated. Additions, alterations, repairs, and relocations shall not cause an existing structure to become unsafe or adversely affect the performance of the building. You have a house that you want to move from, from one lot to another lot. The footers would have to be inspected. The connection from the house to the foundation would have to be inspected. Then we would do a final inspection that, that, it's, that it's safe to go in and out of. The windows open and close, the doors open and close, you have hot and cold running water, the, 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 you've had fire alarms installed into it. You know, if you have an existing house, I highly recommend people put, put smoke alarms in. <clears throat> the building code does not require that to be done. You know, that's one of those things that falls under, under general safety and you should probably do that. Now, with all of that said, on what the code covers, what has to be permitted? Who can get a permit? Any owner or owner's authorized agent who intends to construct, enlarge, alter, repair, move, demolish, or change the occupancy of a building or structure, or to erect, install, enlarge, alter, repair, remove, convert, or replace any electrical, gas, mechanical, or plumbing system, the installation of which is required by this, regulated by this code, or to cause any such work to be performed, shall first make application to the building official and obtain the required permit. Now, quite a few things are exempt from the permit. Permits are not required for fences of not over seven feet high, retaining walls that are not over four feet in height, measured from the bottom of the footing to the top of the wall, uh, water tanks that do not exceed 5,000 gallons, sidewalks and driveways, a, a driveway might require a stormwater permit. You know, it has to do a lot with the intent on what somebody's doing. Painting, papering, tiling, carpeting, cabinets, countertops, and similar finish work do not require a permit. Swimming, prefabricated swimming pools that are less than 24 inches deep. Uh, swings and playground equipment, window only supported by an exterior wall that do not project more than 54 inches from the exterior wall. You know, you see a lot of those in, in a city environment, in, you know, downtown. And decks not exceeding 200 square feet, and, and our standard is we don't require a permit for any deck that's being added. Uh, emergency repairs. Equipment replacements and repairs must be performed in an emergency, emergency situation. The permit application shall be submitted within the next working business day to the building official. You know, a tree hits somebody's house, they can go ahead and start working on it. Just, you know, as soon as they get a chance, they need to come get a permit. Now, that's from the building codes. 
Mr. Lyons? Yeah, I had a question. Um, some of the buildings that you see moving in uh, on people's farms, I'm talking about the small, so I hate the tenant. Well, well I'll get to that. Oh, are you? Okay? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, now, that's that's what the, the, the building codes and the residential building code says. Because with, with all of these rules and regulations, the most stringent rule is the one that applies. If one, if, if one regulation says one thing and something else says something more restrictive, it's the most restrictive one. Now, in the zoning resolution, and I'm not going to read all of this, but the zoning resolution down toward the middle, it says application for a building permit shall be made to the zoning commissioner. However, no building permit shall be required and there shall be no regulation of the erection, construction, or reconstruction of any building or other structure on lands now devoted to agricultural uses or which may hereafter be used for agricultural purposes. Now, that's a whole lot more lenient than what, what I just read from the building code. If someone comes to us and says they want to build a barn for hay storage or a barn to put their tractors in. We still require a permit for that. That is a, that is a true agricultural use we do not charge for. It. The only thing that building permit is doing is giving a record that they're building the structure and, and then we're also stating on there that it's an agricultural use. Once a permit is written for an agricultural use, it cannot be converted because no inspections whatsoever will be done on that building. So that's one of those that falls into, you know, we'll say a gray area. The intent of what they're doing is what's important. People want to come in and say, well, I want to build a barn. One in particular asked him what he was going to do with his barn. He said he was going to store his 25 horsepower tractor and his bush hog that he mows his yard with. That's not an agricultural use. You know, when you've got, I think he had an acre and a half property, he's mowing a yard with a 25 horsepower tractor. I've got lawnmowers bigger than 25 horsepower. But if you've got, you know, if he's wanting to build a, I don't know, a 5,000 square foot barn to store hay in, that's an agricultural use. Uh, issuance of zoning permit. The applicant shall submit a dimension sketch or scale plan including the shape, size, height, and location of all buildings to be erected, altered or moved, and any building on the lot. He shall also state the existing and intended use of all such buildings. We don't require everybody bring plans for a building. The zoning resolution says that we can require it. The building codes both say we can require it. We may eventually get to that. A lot, of, a lot of municipalities do require them. There's a reason they require them. You have a limited amount of inspectors. I don't have the time to go through everybody's house and inspect each little thing sometimes to ensure that it meets code. If they have drawings then their builders should know more about what they're doing if those if, if those drones are approved by an architect. The uh, because as you know as a building inspector, all we're inspecting is to the minimum standard. The minimum standard, for, for lack of a better word, it's minimum. We're not inspecting quality. That's someone else's job. Okay. So the, the Private Act of 1972, Chapter 360, Carter County Regional Planning Commission. Section 6, the commission may make reports and recommendations relating to the plan and development of the county to public officials and agencies, public utility companies, to civic, educational, professional, and other organizations and to citizens. It may recommend to the executive or legislative officials of the county programs for public improvements and the financing thereof. All public officials shall, upon request, furnish to the commission within a reasonable time such available information as it may require for its work. The commission, its members and employees, in the performance of its work, may enter upon any land and make examinations and surveys 
and place and maintain necessary monuments and markers and marks thereon. In general, the commission shall have powers as may be necessary to enable it to perform its purposes and promote county planning. So that section right there, is, as, as most of you know, gives the planning commission the authority to be in charge of all uh, of pretty much everything that goes on in the county. Section 7. Whenever the commission shall have adopted the plan of the county or any part thereof, then and thenceforth, no street, park, or other public way, ground, place, or space, no public building or structure, or no public utility, whether publicly or privately owned, shall be constructed or authorized in the county outside of the municipal boundaries until and unless the location and extent thereof shall have been submitted to and approved by the Planning Commission. Now, if the next section says that if the Planning a lot of things, if the Planning Commission disapproves it, whatever the governing body is that's in charge of that, for example, oh, Elizabeth Electric System wants to put in a new power line somewhere. That has to be submitted to the Planning Commission. The Planning Commission has the right to disapprove that. If the Planning Commission disapproves it, that utility can overwrite that because, you know, they're the public utility, they know what they need to do. So then it goes on. However, if the public way, ground, place, space, building, structure, or utility is one, the authorization or financing of which does not, under the law governing the same, fall within the province of the quarterly county court, and that's, that's the county commission, then the submission to the planning commission shall be by the state, county, district, municipal, or other board or official having such jurisdiction. And then same thing again there, a, a vote by the planning commission to not approve it can be overridden. The widening, narrowing, relocation, vacation, Changing the use, acceptance, acquisition, sale or lease of any street or public way, ground, place, property, or structure shall be subject to similar, similar submission and approval. So basically what this section says is anything that's done on any county-owned property, any public property, has to come to the Planning Commission for their approval. Next section, FEMA National Flood Insurance Program. A permit is required before construction or development begins within any special flood hazard area. Have to have a have to have a floodplain permit to do anything whatsoever in flood zone. Uh, next paragraph under the first section. A community must also review all proposed developments to assure that all necessary permits have been received from those governmental agencies from which approval is required by federal or state law. So there, once again, the FEMA Flood Insurance Program says that any development is being done has to go, has to, go to the Planning Department or possibly to the Planning Commission. Uh, then FEMA defines and... and 44 CFR 59 has a definition for development. Development means any man-made change to improved or unimproved real estate, including but not limited to buildings or other structures, mining, dredging, filling, grading, paving, excavation, or drilling operations, or storage of equipment or materials. So there, once again, anything that's being done is considered development. The Planning Commission is in charge of it. Uh, the MS4 program, Municipal Separate Stormwater System, that is a permit that Carter County has through TDEC. Uh, the state of Tennessee has a, has a storm sewer system permit from the EPA. So if we have a, if we have a storm water or storm sewer issue, it comes to Carter County. We're the ones that go look at it. If we need assistance with it, we'll call TDEC and they'll help us with it. Uh, number one, grading permit. The permit that must be issued by the Director of Planning and Zoning and or agent before any land disturbing activity is undertaken by a developer or when grading, filling, or excavating is proposed on a project. And then it gives, it gives some exceptions. Uh, 2A, 
Such minor land disturbing activities as home and gardens and individual home landscaping repairs and maintenance work. And then some, some utility requirements. Uh, C, preparation for single family residences separately built. Emergency work to protect life, limb, or property. You know, so with, with the MS4 program, not everything requires a permit. A lot of it has to do with, with how many, with how much, how big the development is, how many structures are being built. Uh, regulated land disturbing activities, number two, any person who owns, occupies, and operates private agriculture or forest lands shall not be deemed to be in violation of this ordinance of land disturbing activities which result from the normal functioning of these lands. However, the director has the authority to require BMPs, erosion and sediment control measures if pollution and runoff problems are evident. We normally require a stormwater permit be issued for logging operations. The larger the logging operation, the more important that permit is. Because, you know, they're going in, they're building roads, they're cutting all the trees that, that, that will absorb the water as it comes down. That, that's a huge place that you have massive runoff quick. But, you got 1,500 acres of land on the side of a hill, you're going to plow it for, to, plant, to plant wheat on. There is no permit required whatsoever for that. That falls under agriculture. The MS4 program does not apply to it. <coughs> Any questions on that? So what's the definition of uh, what an agricultural building is or structure? I got hang up on that earlier. It has, it has to do with intent. All right. And, and, so and that's, you, you that's one that, that they come to us and state they're useful. Uh, so Tennessee if you're not using it for the lawnmower, that's not you know, in the old yard. I don't know. But you know, that's a little a little uh, vegetable garden that's still not considered agricultural. The, uh, I don't understand. I'm just... and, it, and it has it, it has a whole lot to do with intent. The uh, the first thing is what's the habitability of it? What's the occupancy going to be on? Are people going to be in that structure normally? If the answer to if the answer to is people are, are people going to be in the structure normally? then it needs to be inspected. If it's a hay barn, then nobody's going to be in there normally. So, so we don't really have the safety concern there that we would have with, you know, building a hospital. Well, I think that goes back to the question I asked earlier, at least in my mind. These little barns that you see made along, you know, set down to do this, some of these little barns, you can actually get those where you can have like two stalls to sit them on your property. Those fall those fall under the accessory building category. Okay. <clears throat> all all accessory buildings, almost everything is re is required to have a permit. Okay. You know there 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 is the odd hay barn or something like that would, that that would be just a a, a clear agricultural use. Mm -hmm. And and the problem there. Is that something that, that when, when I came to work in the planning office that I, that, that I was told that we did? We don't per, we don't charge for a permit for an agricultural building. But then once we adopted the 2015 building codes, 2015 building codes requires that every building be inspected. You know, so so we left that to cover those those very few, and I think we've written three or four agricultural permits in the last year, you know, and all of them has had intent with it. The intent is what's important. So the intent, I hate to keep it. Going back to this little barn that I'm talking about, just a very small, it's 10 to 12, 10 to 16, I'm sorry. And it's gonna have two donkeys going in. The intent is to provide those donkeys shelter. Is that something that would fall into category of the uh, the uh, probably what we would do in that instance right there they came to us and told us that you know that's what they're doing that's all we'll be used for yeah I would consider that an agricultural building we will note that on permit okay 
But then if, you know, five years down the road, they get rid of those donkeys and they start storing their lawnmower in it, they are in violation of the building codes because they changed the occupancy or the use of that building to something different. Because if we go back to, to, to section 101.2, that's one of the things it clearly says is use and occupancy. And, and I will always try to err on the side of the individual. You know, and if it's, if it's something that's a gray area, we will figure, you know, we'll do our best to figure out a solution for it. Now, next section, contractors. And this front sheet was copied directly from TN.gov from TN.gov's website. The, the link is up at the top. Who is required to be a licensed contractor? A Tennessee contractor's license is required before bidding or offering a price for projects $25,000 and up as a prime general contractor. And I'll, I'll skip through some of this. Uh, Tennessee does not have reciprocal agreements with other states, so somebody has a contractor's license in Tennessee in, in North Carolina, it's not valid in Tennessee. A contractor's license is required prior to contracting, bidding, offering to engage, or negotiating price for projects $25,000 or more when acting as one of the, as one of the following. The, the prime general contractor bidding or contracting directly with the owner of the project a subcontractor contracting directly with the, with the prime contract with the contractor, not the owner, on anything that the project total is $25,000 or more. And that total includes all materials, equipment, and labor. If somebody comes to us and they say they're going to build a, a 2,000 square foot house and they're going to build it for $40,000 because they're going to do all the work themselves and, and, and they have a whole bunch of materials that they got free somewhere, that doesn't matter. According to the building code, that is calculated on, on the cost of what those what you would have to pay for those materials to buy them and labor counts. Uh, construction management. When the value of the total project is $25,000 or more and you need, a, you, you need a project manager, they are required by state law to have a general contractor's license. Next page. Tennessee Code Annotated 62-6103, license requirement, recovery of expenses by an unlicensed contractor. And that's a, I don't really understand why they have it called that. I think they called it that and over the years they've changed it. And basically what this is saying is if you don't have, if you don't have a licensed contractor working for you, you take him to court he does not have to return the money for the labor. The only thing you can hold him responsible for is, is materials. Now, I'm not a lawyer. I'm not real certain on, on that's what it's saying there. The important thing in this section is go down to 2B. The first two sentences, the, the first sentence says, except in counties with a population of not less than 777,113. You can just draw a line through that because what is the after that is what's important. In that county with that population, this section does not apply. It applies to everybody else in the state. A person or firm specified in subdivision A2A shall not make more than one application for a permit to construct a single residence or shall not construct more than one single residence within a period of two years. There shall be a rebuttal presumption that the person or firm, or firm intends to construct for the purpose of resale, lease, rent, or any other similar purpose if more than one application is made for a permit to construct a single residence or if more than one single residence is constructed within a period of two years. So what this is saying, that this whole section right here, what it's saying is that as a homeowner, you can build one house every two years you do not have to hire a general. You can be your own contractor. Now, if you back up to the other part, if you hire a contractor as homeowner, 
And you end up taking him to court, he doesn't, he, he, the, the court cannot make him repay you for the labor. So, you know, there's, it, it, it's pretty serious. If you're going to build your own house as a homeowner, you better know what you're looking at. Because you are the general contractor. You have to have the liability insurance. All of that stuff that that general contractor has to have, you have to have as homeowner. If you don't, if, if you build your own house and you don't have liability insurance and somebody dies in the construction process, you probably just lost everything you have. Now, the reason this is in here is because we're getting more and more complaints of, well, it's my property, I should be able to do what I want to. And I really have no problem with that, other than we have a whole lot of codes that requires that, that, that people do according to the, the minimum of these codes. Because ultimately, no one is going to live forever. At some point, that property will belong to someone else. That's what I'm concerned with, is when that next person takes over that piece of property, that they have something safe to them. You know, if something happens, somebody owns a parcel of land and they've got structures on it, they die, they have no heirs, the county takes it after three years for back property taxes, there may be a concern on that property of who's responsible for those structures if the county sells it. I have no idea what the legalities of that are, but that's the point we're getting to in building codes. The 2015 codes that we adopted are a whole lot stricter than the 2009 codes the state was inspecting under. Uh, some of the municipalities around here have already adopted the 2018 building codes. Now, that takes us to the, to the last one here. This one has become an issue a number of times. Fire protection of floor assemblies, dwelling garage openings, penetrations, and separation. And the first section here is, is, a, is a whole lot of definitions, and I won't read these two. The, uh, it talks about an attic, the different an attic and an inhabitable attic. One, day, one I will read here, habitable space. A space in a building for living, sleeping, eating, or cooking. Bathrooms, toilet rooms, closets, halls, storage, and utility spaces in similar areas are not considered habitable spaces. A habitable space has to have a proper egress out of it. Now, the, the next page is some more definitions. Then it talks about the dwelling garage opening and sections that it has to be in accordance with, opening protection, dwelling, garage, fire separation, I've got a chart I'll get to about it, under stair protection, enclosed accessible space under stairs shall have walls, under stair surface, and any soffits protected on the enclosed side with half-inch gypsum board. A lot of you will remember you used to go in Grandma's house, and we'd all go play under the steps because you could reach through and grab somebody's foot when they walked up the steps. That hasn't been legal for many, many years. Uh, flame spread index and smoke develop index for wall and ceiling finishes. Uh, 302.9.1 flame spread index. Wall and ceiling finishes shall have a flame, flame spread index of not greater than 200. That is something that is actually tested. The, the, you know, you'll see you know, the carpet on the floor. The carpet's fireproof now. They take that carpet, they go in and test how long it takes it to burn, and it should, you know, the, it should not burn continuously. It should go out unless the proper, you know, fuel is provided for it. You know, the, the wall coverings, the ceiling, ceiling coverings, the, the coverings over the lines, everything that, that is put in a building today has a flame spread index on it. You know, fortunately, we don't have a lot of fires in Carter County. But then we don't allow people to build houses as close as they build them in Nashville. You know, you go to big cities and you see these huge subdivisions, they've got houses four or five feet apart. House catches on fire, a fire truck can't drive down the side. One house catches on fire, half the neighborhood will burn down before they get the fire put out. Uh, table R302.6, dwelling garage separation. And this, this is where I'm starting the important part of what I've got in here. 
from the residents and attics not less than half inch sheetrock or equivalent applied to the garage side of the garage from habitable rooms above the garage. Five eighths inch type X gypsum, the difference in half inch and five eighths, the five eighths type X is fire rated. Half inch sheetrock has never has never been tested for you know for how long it will last in fire. Structure supporting floor ceiling assemblies used for separation required by this section. Not less than half inch gypsum border equivalent. Garages located less than three feet from a dwelling unit on the same lot. Not less than half inch sheetrock. So if you build a detached accessory building, you build, you're putting a garage in it, you have to come and get a permit for it. It's an accessory building. We don't do a whole lot of inspections. But if that building is within three feet of the house, then it has to be inspected to see that it has the proper sheetrock in it so that fire won't go through that wall. Now, 302.13, fire protection of floors. And I'll explain this before I start reading it. I'm sure most all of you have seen it. Somebody used to build a two-story house. The top of it was the main part of the house, and downstairs they had what everybody called basement. No habitable spaces in that basement. Maybe had a garage door in it that you know you can go in the whole thing. It was one great big huge garage. That changed on the 2012 code. On the 2015 code, they got more restricted on it. What this says: floor assemblies that are not required elsewhere in this code to be fire fire resistance rated shall be provided with a half inch gypsum wallboard membrane, 5 8 inch wood structural panel membrane or equivalent on the underside of the floor framing member. So you have that, that downstairs area or basement or whatever, you know, various people want to call it various things. It has to have sheetrock under the floor. There is no such thing as a standard rule as an unfinished room in a house in the now, if you have a sprinkler system in that house, you don't have to finish the underside of the floor. Uh, number two, floor assemblies located directly over a crawl space not intended for storage or fuel fire appliances. There are some jurisdictions that are making contractors do the entire crawl space with sheetrock. Depending on the height of that crawl space, it is required. Me personally, I think she's rocking, rocking a crawl space is the dumbest idea ever. I, I'm glad you said that. I don't have to repeat that just to make sure I heard that. that that's, that's what the code says. Because you have to remember, this is an international code. This code is, it is made for a whole lot of places other than, than Carter County, Tennessee. And yes, there are places other than Carter County, Tennessee. Uh, what I recommend people to do is that's, that's where we go back up here and it talks about the 5 8, inch, 5 8 inch plywood or the equivalent. There's a number of different things that are, that are available that can be used so that sheetrock doesn't have to be put in. Uh, then, portions of floor assembly shall be permitted to be unprotected for, for complying with the following. The aggregate area is less than 80 feet. It's fire blocked on the back of the last page. Wood floor assemblies using dimension lumber or structural composite lumber equal to or greater than two by 10. So if you use two by 10s or two by 12s, that rule does not apply. And I've seen two by eights that the guy wanted to complain that he didn't know what the code was. I've seen Two by eights in an existing building that the guy had to do a whole lot of work on on this old house. That he, and then he poured concrete in the basement floor. I've seen the TGIs or the, the, the plywood joists that, that a number of people have wanted to complain about. Why do they have to do it? That, but yet they came and got a building permit that clearly tells them that their house has to be built to 2015 codes will be inspected to 2015 codes 
And I'm pretty sure that most of these people don't even read these permits. They think we're obligated to give them a permit. We're not. We're obligated to ensure the safety of everybody in this county. And if we have to refuse a permit to ensure someone else's safety, then, then we have to do that. You know, I can't let one person build a, you know, a, a, a nine-story tall house right beside somebody else's mobile home that when the wind blows, it's going, it's going to blow down on top of it. And that's pretty much all I've got on that, Mr. Lyons. Even though you can't authorize the permit, you try to work with those individuals to try to help them get to the point that they can. Oh, yeah. That's I mean, I, I will go out of my way to work with people. That's what I thought. But on the other hand, though, I can't be their engineer. Right. I don't have an engineering license. The only thing I can do as inspector is inspect what they have done. I can't go in there and tell them how to build it. But you do try to help I can, the process. I can, I can go through the code and show them what the code says. And I go out of my way to do that. I will always go out of my way. That's, that's my job as building inspector. But, and, and like I said, because all I'm inspecting to is the minimum. I would love to be able to inspect quality. The building code does not grant me the authority to do that. Now, does this planning commission have to approve the site plans and the grading plans and the building plans? And do we charge them money when they come and uh, well, as a, as and a general, build a building? And as a general rule, that's the purpose of the planning department. We, we, are the, we are the working body for the Planning Commission. Most of that stuff comes to us. There are certain things that has to come to the Planning Commission for approval. Uh, campgrounds have to be approved by the, by the Planning Commission. Subdivisions more than so many lots have to come to the Planning Commission. Uh, so, uh, Building new cell phone towers has to be approved by the Planning Commission. We've got, we actually have one cell phone tower company right now that is going to build a, that they want to build a new tower. Then after that tower is built, they're going to tear down the old tower. Because they are building a new tower in a different location than the existing one, that has to come to the Planning Commission for their approval. As, as Planning Department, we don't have the authority to approve that. Your, your, your standard construction, you know, for you know, a Dollar General, or a residential house, or a barn, or an accessory building, that's the purpose of the Planning Department. We take care of all that stuff because if we brought everything we had to the Planning Commission, we'd be here for days and we'd, we'd, we'd be here two, three times a week. So you all determine what we hear, is that right? I don't think I like that. No, we, 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 we don't determine what you hear. We go by what the existing laws are that says we have to bring it to the Planning Commission. Pretty much any, anything other than, than your standard construction, we submit to the Planning Commission for their approval. Mr. Lyons? One last question. First of all, comment. This is the most in-depth information I've received, and I commend you on it. Thank you. It really is. Going back to the page where you talked about 1972 chapter, 365 County Regional Planning Commission. I think I heard you say, and I want to make sure I clarify this now. I think I heard you say that you all have the responsibility of all the counties in Carter County, is that correct? Or just all building permits that are asking to be built. And the reason, let me, I'm not trying to set you up. Let me tell you the reason. Let me tell you the reason I'm asking the question. I'm trying to figure out in my mind how that's the, the 
Building and Grounds Committee, how do they interact with the planning, uh, planning and zoning office so that in the future we'll know how the building and grounds should be acting in terms of uh, our county buildings. That's where the question's coming from. And, and all, all I can do here is, is, is read, you know, read word for word what it says. No street, park, or other public way, ground, place of space, no public building or structure, or no public utility, where the publicly or privately owned shall be constructed or authorized in the county outside of municipal boundaries until and unless the location and extent thereof shall have been submitted to and approved by the planning commission. So if we want to if we want to build something that belongs to the county or on county property, so this says it has to go to the two planning commission for their approval. In terms of building a new or erecting a new building. Or what I'm talking about is the our existing county buildings. All existing. Do you all have any oversight and or responsibility in those buildings? If we go back to, to the first page, 2015 International Building Code. The provisions of this code shall apply to the construction, alteration, relocation, enlargement, replacement, repair, equipment, use and occupancy, location, maintenance, removal, and demolition of every building or structure or any appurtenances connected or attached to such buildings and structures. So that, that sentence right there replaces The word constructed. <laughs> that says that you know construction covers everything. According to International Building Code, everything has to come to the to, to the planning department for a permit. And then if it's if it's county property, it has to come to the planning commission for their approval or disapproval. The planning commission can disapprove. And the, the, the county the, the quarterly county court or the county commission has the authority to override that decision. The reason this is saying, in, in my opinion, the reason it is stating that the planning commission is, is, is the governing body responsible for ensuring that those buildings are built correctly, that any developments are done correctly in accordance with the plans of, of where things should be located. Does, does that act, does, is well, that better? Somewhat. The reason I'm asking the question, maybe I can go to the chair or to Chris, the director. We're getting ready, as you all know, to set new committees in place. Building the grounds and all those standing committees. And so I'm trying to figure out in my mind, going forward, where does the building the grounds, the example, Chris, when the, we did the remodel on the health department and on the election commission, we remember we still have several different projects that are on the list. I'm trying to figure out how are they going to be the overseer of all those projects working hand to hand with permitting from your, your guys' office. You see what I'm trying to say? I'm trying to figure out to give them really a guess. Well, I'm just going to be honest with you. The, her this. The, the, the planning department is not the overseer. Okay. You have a, a construction manager is required with a general contractor's license to be for, for construction manager. The air, it has to come to the planning commission for their approval or disapproval. It has to come to the planning department for us to issue a permit for it. <coughs> so uh, in the attributes uh, of the uh, health department where it's a state agency, uh, probably not that one. The uh, election commission should have been, yes, sir. Okay. Uh, and the maybe the one we have on some of the ones we have on the list that be building grounds responsibility for it. going to be their responsibility to make sure they have the work in hand in hand with you guys. Right. We'll do a uh, uh, plan review, a okay. cursory plan review, and then uh, bring it forward to get it to the board. Okay, thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Yes, sir. Correct, uh, Mr. Chair. But basically, anytime we have an AD firm that does any design for new or remodeling, in their specifications, it's supposed to be for general conditions that the contractor 
is responsible for the permitting the containment permit, which goes through the planning for inspection of all such as. So what, what the chair is also looking at brought the question is that under the building grants of the FA adopt uh, the policy that each project that is bid out by the financial department, uh, the bid process, that that they also are going to hire a person to oversee it. Now, I know you play a word on the game word of whether he's a construction manager or just a construction, uh, maybe a technical representative of this county. You know, they can do that, that the overseas that the building is constructed according to plan and specification. And then if it is not, he finds a, or she finds a problem that they scream wolf to the county to the plan return to the full general commission. You know, so uh, it has to be within some guidelines of when we have construction, and you get to the item of what's called a change order. Who does it go to? Who has the authority to approve, disapprove, or review? You know, so there's a lot of those requirements that they're going to have to go through and examine the right if they go through such a system like that. And then two, to exempt from licensing this county can be self-insured to where they don't have to do that. And all, uh, all your federal and state facilities are like that now to where anybody be named firm name the project manager, then they're exempt from having to have a project line of manager's license or a club member's license paid because they are a self-insured government entity. That's how they get they can say get by, but that's how they're uh, different than just a private but I, um, yeah. It's in the house and it's just going to pay for a better exactly. Any further questions? Thank you, Mr. McKay. Thank you, Mr. McKay. Next item is the uh, RV. RV Park is getting postponed temporarily and I'll be on some engineering work. Next is an update on the projects. Uh, we had a meeting with uh, Mr. Goodall with the Warm Lobby of the Tour. Uh, he's going to release the real name for it here uh, in a few weeks. But uh, we discussed the water system that he did. Uh, he's punched two wells. He's getting just about 200 gallons per minute right now. Very good water. Uh, he's been working with Mountain Electric to move his three bays in for his pump systems and uh, the rest of the development. And we're sitting here about the third week, I believe, of his stormwater pollution prevention plan that is at TDA, Kensington Park Environment Conservation, for their review. Uh, so we're moving forward. Hopefully, uh, October will be able to have groundbreaking. We'll get more willing and the weather cooperates, and uh, engineers do their job. So that's where we stand there. What's that date on that? Uh, possibility of October 17th. Be the actual ground break. That's on the third, if I'm not mistaken. Any questions on that or concerns? 10 30 is the time. 10 30 is the time of the ground break. Right. I think, uh, Mr. Chair, just want to comment. Yes. Any uh, body that would like to go up and uh, tour what he has done thus far, I think he would be very uh, open for that. Um, he's done quite a bit of work. I think it's going to be a beautiful resort. Um, I think the architect, Ken Ross, has designed uh, some very eco-friendly eco engineering, uh, wind turbines that you will not see, uh, water features that will lead to not only enhanced but purified. And um, in my discussions with him um, and his meeting with us, he's very much um, forward looking on protecting that area. Uh, I, I'm very impressed with what I've seen and having the opportunity to walk the property with him is just, I mean, he's really got, no, got great vision and I think it's, it's going to be a, a, a wonderful uh, addition to Park County. And he tried to get us updates every four to six weeks. Yeah. So we're still a little long. Uh, that meeting took us a few minutes. Yes, sir. Does anybody want to go up there? Very good. 
come in here and we'll take the upper room. We've got the transportation to help us come in. Okay. We'll be your call. His call. We'll be more than happy. Sonny, you want to go? Greg, you'd like to go if you've got time? Yeah. I've been up there already. Any better time to make a you got to view me. You got to view me like a rabbit. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. 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 I'm sorry
everything, just, just about every rock that will be moved up there will require a permit for that rock to be moved. You know, they're the, definitely crossing their T's and dotting their I's, so it's, it's, it's well done. I'm not questioning that. I'm not questioning that whatsoever. Okay, what I was questioning is trying to dispel what transpired we in, in this county, and we need to make sure that it happens in the future. That's right. all I'm saying. I hope those rocks were locked up get sailed. I did just feel like they did it. But anyway, uh, as the mayor said, you know, the mud is yeah. steam. But uh, the technical <laughs> trying to, to control that and everything to meet their criteria actually went above and beyond. They actually had two tankers up there to receive any water, additional water that may come out of that well. Uh, Destroy for my question is, you know, with a large construction like that, knowing the number that we have on our planners in our office, with the, the amount of work that's going to have to be done out of that office daily, because, you know, you've got superstructures, you have the inspector, and then you have the codes enforcement. What's that going to be timeline? Well, that occurs from the budget where they cut us on the budget. Uh, the but yeah, we'll be spread thin on the, on the whole, whole. Like everything else going on, you know, you can you can teach to them, son, but they ain't nothing to do with students. <laughs> you, can make, you, you can make sure a student doesn't have a class. That's my yeah. Yeah. You know, it's just like the laws. They they only want to read the first sentence, but they don't care about the other twenty pages behind it. Right. Exactly. The uh, other on the on the projects. Okay. Next is number seven, report of recovery soldier ministry on Piedmont Drive. Uh, Mr. McKay and I love to research this. I'll let Mr. McKay give the report. The, uh, we addressed this at the last commission meeting, and I thought we had answered all the questions, but we went ahead and, and went through the entire procedure again. Then at, at the previous commission meeting, package was given out to the commissioners and I'm, I'm not going to read this I'm not going to read the whole thing I'm just going to read some some of the sentences it says when I was allowed to speak about the business that is running a transitional home in my residential neighborhood I was told that it was given permits to run as a rental and grandfathered in with all of the violations then recovery soldiers chose to help these men but have set them up for failure in your community by not following the laws and rules why and how they got the permits is still not understood by myself and my neighbors. The mobile homes are not set off of the roadway. One is on the roadway. The property is 0.6 acres. These properties have never been within zoning and planning rules and regulations. The property is too small for one mobile home, let alone two. The men that live in the homes park in the road due to limited, limited space blocking the roadway that the homes are positioned against and on the roadway could block any rescue attempt for the homes and neighbors farther down the road. Then, on the second sheet, I have provided everyone here today with proof in the form of pictures, emails, and text messages. Everyone can see the violations with the business and residential area, violations with planning and zoning. And when more transitional homes are purchased, they will be given permits as a rental. Now, as, as building official and assistant director of planning, I take a serious offense to a whole lot of stuff that's written in here. And I'll go through a lot of it. To start with, with some of the stuff on this page, this property is not zoned residential. It's zoned A1, that's an agricultural zone. No permit whatsoever from Carter County Planning and Zoning is required to use a dwelling of any sort as rental property. We do not permit that. If we tell someone that it is a permitted use, that does not mean we wrote a permit. That means it is, it, it, is, it is an allowed use. Existing non-conforming is the proper definition for two mobile homes on this piece of property. At 0.6 acres, depending on what zone that piece of property is in, it could be used for two dwellings like it's being used today. 
There are no violations existing to date on this piece of property. None whatsoever. So for A1, it could and can have two dwellings. What they are doing there is a legal use, and, and I'll get to that. Now, to, to go on through this packet that was given out and was told to everyone that it was accurate information. <coughs> Top, over here in the middle, that's where the two trailers are. Go to the next picture. Down here at the bottom, you see a yellow line. That's the property line going across the top of the trailer. This map is printed from tnmap.tm.gov. It does not show where property lines are. It is not accurate. If you look at that website, it has a big red disclaimer on it. It says these property lines are not accurate. Will not hold up in court. This, the only thing this website through the state is, is a representation of how one piece of property touches another piece of property. There's places in the county that these lines are dead on probably to the inch. There's places they're off three or four hundred yards. When you take a one-dimensional map that, you, that a survey's done on, and you take a picture from satellite, you can't lay that piece of property down on that map. It won't work. They use the exact dimensions. Things get really messed up in places. These lines, that is not where the property lines on that piece of property. Next one. Okay. Next Do you have a picture show that's where the property lines? No. The, the, we'll, we'll get to that. The, the next page <coughs> says Article 5 Zoning Districts. <coughs> Section 501, Classification of Districts. For the purpose of this resolution, the following zoning districts are hereby established in the unincorporated sections of Sevier County and are shown on the zoning map of Sevier County, Tennessee. As Assistant Director of Planning and Zoning and Building Official for Carter County, I don't care what Sevier County has for zoning. Next page is the, is the tax record printed off of tnmap.tn.gov. In the middle of the picture, I've got, it, I've got it circled. It says subdivision data. If nothing is in that space, the piece of property has never been surveyed. We do not know where those property lines are. We could go out and guesstimate where they are. The only way to know exactly where those pieces, where, where that property is, is a survey has to be done by a licensed surveyor. Next page. Rooming and boarding houses up at the top. You see it's from national.gov. Our regulations are totally different from Nashville's. Next page, same thing. I assume this is from Nashville, something about businesses operating in the residential zone districts. This is not a page out of Arizona. Next page says Department of Mental Health and Substance Abuse Services, current licensees. Licensing category for providers with names containing recovery soldier ministries. No sites, facilities found matching your criteria. That is not what they're doing over there. If they were doing that, they would, the state would have a license for it. Next page talks about... Oh, wait, this is Department of Mental Health and Substance Abuse Services. That is people who are in a treatment facility receiving treatment drugs. Awesome. And, I, and I, I don't have that written definition. The uh, Arizona, we, we have a resolution that covers methadone clinics. If they were running a methadone clinic, it would probably show up here. They're not running a methadone clinic. Uh, next page is provider eligibility criteria for something involving Department of Mental Health as an alcohol and drug treatment provider. They are not providing treatment for anything in those two trailers. Next page is out of Tennessee Code 137111. Chapter 13 is zoning. We have a regional planning commission, Carter County Regional Planning Commission, you all. We have our own set of zoning laws. Our zoning laws apply instead of the state's generic rules. Almost word for word, this section here 
is in our zone. The problem is they, they have no violations of our zoning code over there. Then the next page is talking about ADA. We do not have the authority, any of us sitting in this room do not have the authority to go over there and ask them what, what those people who live there are there for. That is a direct violation of, of HIPAA and all kinds of other laws. And that's, that's something that, you know, the, the ADA discussion is way too complicated to get into today over that. Now, with all of that said, and then there, in, in the packet that was given to the commission was, was a bunch of other pictures, and if anybody wants to look at this at the meeting, I'll have it laid here. So I went completely through our zoning code. Now, to back up a little bit, when I first went to Recovery Soldiers Ministries and asked them what they were doing, how many people were living there, I think they had said that at one time they had four people living in one of the trailers that has three bedrooms in it. And the standard we gave them at that time was one person per bedroom. Then the other trailer has two people living in it. And supposedly those two people are students at, I think at a man. So to go through some of the stuff here that I wrote down in Arizona. Definitions. Multifamily dwelling. A building or portion thereof designed for long-term occupancy by three or more families living independently of each other. That would be a multi-unit townhouse or condominiums. Single-family dwelling. That's what this is, a single-family dwelling. A detached building designed for long-term occupancy by one family only. A definition of dwelling. Of two family dwelling. A detached building designed for long term occupancy by two families living independently of each other. Okay, so let's go back to single family dwelling. The first thing most people, including me, would say is that's not a, they, they have more than a single family dwelling in there. But it just so happens in our zoning, section 221 defines family. Family is defined as an individual or two or more persons related by blood, marriage, legal adoption, or legal guardianship, living together as one housekeeping unit using one kitchen and providing meals or lodging to not more than three unrelated persons living together as one housekeeping unit using one kitchen. So, if we use the definition of family and you have an individual or two persons related by blood marriage, legal adoption, or legal guardianship. So we've got one or two people. They can have three unrelated people living together with them in a single family dwelling. So when I gave them the standard of one person per bedroom, they could actually have four people in that room, in, in, in that thing total, if they're considering one of them the, the individual. Now, next definition. And this definition may need to be submitted to be changed because I'm pretty sure it's worded wrong. It says home, homes for the mentally retarded, mentally handicapped, or physically handicapped. Those words should not pretty much shouldn't be used as far as ADA is concerned. Now, the definition of this any home in which eight or fewer unrelated or physically handicapped persons mentally retarded and or mentally handicapped reside and may include two additional persons acting as house parents or guardians and need not be related to each other or to any of the mentally retarded mentally handicapped or physically handicapped persons residing in the home shall be classified as a single family residence the above definition shall not apply to such family residences wherein handicapped persons reside when such residences are operated on a commercial basis. Non-conforming structure or use. A lawful existing structure or use at the time of this ordinance or any amendment thereto becomes effective 
which does not conform to the requirements of the zone in which it was located. And you all know we have these, we have properties all over the county that are existing, non-conforming. We have houses that are built across property lines that individuals wind up going to court over it so the judge can decide what they do with it. It was, you know, things that were built before the zoning rules were, were put in place. You know, everybody wants to say, well, let's get rid of the planning office. We don't need them. Yes, we do. We need the planning office, the planning commission more than anything else. That's why the state requires that we have a regional planning commission because without it, it is anarchy or chaos would be the proper words to use. Go to Johnson County, you'll see what I'm talking about. People build houses across property lines. They're building structures that are four or five stories tall, houses four or five stories tall. You look at them, the, the, the wind's going to blow them over. So back to this, uh, next definition. Rooming or boarding house. A building containing a single dwelling unit and not more than five guest rooms where lodging is provided with or without meals for compensation. Next definition, substance abuse treatment clinic or facility. A building or portion of a building other than a clinic containing offices, facilities, or designated space with the predominant, substantial, or significant purpose of prov providing outpatient treatment, counseling, or similar services to individuals who are dependent on legal and illegal drugs, opiates, alcohol, or other similar substances. Staffing by physicians who have received a waiver or have been certified or should have received a waiver or will be certified by the Substance Abuse Treatment Act of 2000 and subsequent amendments or enactments shall create a presumption that the building or portion of a building should be designated a substance abuse treatment facility. A substance abuse treatment clinic or facility is not a medical clinic. Now, if y'all remember, we had that problem about four years ago up in Lynn Valley, you know, TV was there. It had to take stock work orders up because people thought they were just going to randomly put in meth clinic. Now, that's all the definitions. Next thing, Article 5, General Provisions. Continuance of non-conforming uses. Any lawful use of any building or land existing at the time of the enactment of this ordinance or whenever a district is changed by an amendment thereafter may be, may be continued, although such use does not conform with the provisions of this ordinance with the following limitations. Article 6, use requirements by districts. A1, General Agricultural District. It is the intent of this district to provide space for agriculture and agriculturally oriented uses and structures which provide an important part in the economy for Carter County and at the same time provide space for development for an ever-expanding population. This district is intended to provide locations for urbanization which are compatible with agricultural uses and to establish standards for future development. Once again, it's zoned agriculture. And I'm not going to read all this if all of you have the zoning. And, you know, and, if, and if, you, you know, if you read through something have questions, come and see me and, and we'll go over it. So under, under A1, you can have detached single-family dwellings, two-family and multi-family dwellings, one mobile home on a single lot only. Oh, wait a minute. There's two mobile homes on that lot. There is because it is a non-existing, non-conforming use. The latest those trailers were put there, we can figure out, was about 1982, I think. One of them was probably there quite a bit before that. You know, that's, that's many years before zoning ever came in. Uh, area regulations. All buildings shall be set back from street or road right of way lines and lot lines to comply with the following yard requirements. Minimum for, now remember it said one mobile home on a single lot only. So there could, if, if, it's, if we're doing that today, there can only be one mobile home there. But let's put something else there. Let's put a two-family dwelling there. How much square feet does it take? Minimum for two-family and multi-family units, 15,000 square feet. Each additional unit, 7,500 square feet. We have two units, that's 22,500. 
that is less than six tenths of an acre. If we went over there and got rid of those two trailers and built a, a multi-family unit, yes, the same thing can be built on that property. Can't be mobile homes because we restrict mobile homes to one on a single lot. Uh, zone R3. I won't read all this, but I'll, I'll tell you the reason I put it in here is because in R3, within the R3 high density residential district, Carter County, the following uses are permitted boarding and rooming houses. So something has to be zoned a minimum of R3 to have a boarding house. Now, part of the reason I put some of this stuff in here is because we have another issue with another house that is doing sort of the same thing. They may be in violation of building codes because I was told that they did some remodeling in the house and added some rooms. And if they've done that, they're in violation because of the size of the lot and the septic system. As opposed to these two over on Piedmont, they have one person per room, well within in, in, in one trailer, two people in the that's within the rules that we have established. Now, something else I have on here. And this may be the most important thing I've read all day. Tennessee Code Annotated, Title 66, Property, Chapter 28, Uniform Residential Landlord and Tenant Act. Part 1, General Provisions. And I know we have some commissioners that have a whole lot of rental property. I don't know if any of you guys do. Uh, 66-28-102 application and then remember this is for the Uniform Residential Landlord and Tenant Act. Section 8. This chapter applies only in counties having a population of more than 75,000 according to the 2010 federal census or any subsequent federal census. That's something you hear, we hear daily sometimes. Well, the, the, the the tenant act, the, the landlord and the tenant act says such and such. Doesn't matter. Per state code, it does not apply in our county under any circumstances. And that's pretty much all I've got. So, who has questions? I do. So you're saying that in those circumstances, it's the, what we're talking about in Piedmont, they've not broken any rules, any uh, codes, Correct. Requirements. Correct. Everything they are doing is, in, is, is, is within our standards. Even they have 15 or 16 people in those trailers. They, uh, I have no proof of that. And if someone comes in and tells me that they saw 15 or 16 people there, it's private property, they're infringing, on, and this is my opinion, they're infringing on, on, on that property owner's rights because what if, what if they're having a party? I've been parties before various places that there's a whole lot more than 15 or 16 people living there. I really don't think well, no, they, they ever had... They're having a party to their place. Right. They're living there for several weeks. The, uh, that's, that's a little bit <laughs> When, when, when I went and talked to Recovery Soldiers Ministries, they told me that everybody they have living there has a long-term lease. Have we got a copy of those leases? I, I do, we do not have the authority to ask them for that. Hmm. Under any circumstances can we ask that. We cannot ask them for the names of the people who live there. We, can't, we cannot ask them why those people live, live there. That is a violation of a whole bunch of federal laws and if those people are there because of, uh, of, of their transitioning from a, from a drug program or an alcohol program that, have, that are considered to be disabilities by the federal government, if we go over there and ask them those questions, we're in violation of a whole lot of laws. And I will not do that under any circumstances. If somebody orders me to do it, I won't go ask them. So we as a county can't go ask for any information. It'd be, like, it'd be like me coming to your house and saying, okay, Mr. Jenkins, how many people have you got living here? Well, do any of them have... Well, the census does that pretty much. Do, 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 you know, 
I can't ask those questions. And, and I have spent a lot, a lot of time on <clears throat> figuring out if this is legal. Not only for, not only for this one place, but for the other place and, and for going down the road, you know, so that we have the correct answer for it. And everything I can come up with, you know, I, I think the most important thing here is, is the definition of a family unit being one or two people with not more than three unrelated people living there with them. So what can this board do to keep this from happening in the future? What zoning changes can we put in place so this does not happen? in the future okay so so explain what your what when you say you don't want this to happen what is this halfway houses within residential life. define a halfway house you define I don't, I don't have a definition for that no that's what i'm saying we, we would have to have that defined. a halfway house <laughs> is, is, is we have a problem clearly and I don't have an answer. And I would like to have an answer. Okay. So, I mean, us as a group of people, as a, as a board, I mean, the, we can put so, our heads together and figure this out. So, so explain to me what the problem is, and I will try to address that. Well, I mean, I'm pretty sure it's pretty obvious what the problem is. Good. It's not to me. I need you to explain to me what you think the problem is. It's a report. It's on our agenda that... Um, the problem that, that, that we see on this, uh, we had no way to prove that there were 16 people living there. I, mean, I don't see that happening. But well, what would they need to do if they did come to the proof, say, here is proof that there are 16 people living in this house, or 15, whatever. Then what's going to happen to you? Well, I think mean, it's another, another avenue to deal with, but until we have proof, we don't have that. Do we, I'm sorry, do we have any idea or can we ask this question? How is this program set up? Is it a diversionary program, step down term program, from the court system? Hey, so I'll ask that for you, Mr. Ross. Yes, sir. Where the two trailers are, right. those are real pieces. Once these people graduated the program, right. okay. it's a totally voluntary program to go into and, left, and, and they lockstep. step. They get nicotine tested, they get drug tested, they get overseen. So it's a diver diversionary program coming out of the court, it sounds like. No, and it's not. not. No, they got to take the court together. The program is entirely voluntary. Let's say that, that program would go to stay in jail. No, no, no. This, they have like nothing to do with the court ordered program. Okay. People, people who got it. Okay, I'm sorry. Who set the program up? We didn't know that. How is it set up? It's is, it set up by the, is it set up by the landlord? It is Recovery Soldiers Ministries Program. It's set up as a ministry. They are they have to be licensed. Somebody has to be licensed. It's not. Is that through DMR? Is that through? They, they don't. They the don't MCU. need. They don't need any licensing for that. They don't need any license for that. No. They don't. He say license for the ministry and what they're doing as far as that's, you don't have to have a license for ministry. The church just sets it up like a youth group program. Correct. But this is not a youth group program. It's not. It's not. But I'm just saying this, this, it sounds like it's similar to the church has set it up as a program, an outreach program to try to help these individuals, which is commendable. Correct. Commendable. But, but it seems to me like there should be some kind of. You know, when you have a reporter complain about and, this and, and, and there is. And then we go back to, to section 254, substance abuse treatment clinics or facilities. They're not doing substance abuse treatments. If, let me say this. If, if we, if the state of Tennessee, DOC, I know two Department of Children's Services, if they have an allegation faith-based organization of sexual abuse, physical abuse, whatever may be going on. And the same thing with adult protective services and the Department of Human Services. If they receive an allegation of something going on in a faith-based organization, church and or others, they do an investigation. 
So that's fine. They can do those investigations. Yeah, as far as uh, 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 we see the model one or so. Uh, the, the, the only complaint that we've received is, is I don't want this in my neighborhood. And I'm not, you know, I'm all for these people. Thank God that they've got a program to go get help with. I really am. They don't need to be they don't need to be repeat offenders of course. So thank God for these programs. But when something comes up that's kind of an issue in our in our community, we need to try to work with someone, I think, to try to get at the bottom of it. Who set it up? How's it set up? Can we Go about the system and resolve the problem. Oh, I, mean, I understand yeah, too. Right. I understand I'll too. That information before next month. That's I just right. understand too that y'all can't ask questions. But, that. but that's what. I, but believe me, I spent I spent a lot of hours on this. Oh, I, I can tell. We spent an hour with explanation. We, we we get a we get a we get a whole lot of people that call our office with a complaint. And since the complaint, I've been going up there. Have you? I haven't seen anything. Uh, one morning early, there was a loud truck that went up through there. Uh, that man, that man. Wild, loud truck, and uh, the you know it, it went and stopped at one of the trailers. So we turned around actually, and one of the drivers was the shit. Have we? Can we find out <coughs> if we can ask questions with him? What's going on all the time? I can, that's no problem. I can get it every day. I guess that's a job. It's a job. It's a job. It's a job. It's a job. Well, we need to have them here. We don't. Because they love them. Yeah. The other things are not there. The, uh, what do you think about that? Well, they believe we may not be able to ask them the questions. I think basically what we need to do is let me get the information that Mr. Lyons is requesting and if they feel comfortable with relying on that. I'm just trying to work through the problem, Chris. Yeah. Uh, will, will you take care of that for that too? Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lyons. Thank you, Mr. Lyons. Last month's commission, yeah, at, the, at the, the county commission meeting, the sheriff spoke about this. They, they, they've been to the sheriff, they've been to the DA. Both the sheriff and the DA, from what I understand, say that everything they're doing over there is legal. That's the same thing we're saying as the planning office. As per our regulations, they are doing nothing different than if I took my house and rented it to people the same way. They're, they are not doing any sorts of treatments in these places. All they're doing is leasing their property. They have a, they have a leasehold. They live on that piece of property. Yeah, many times travel, construction and stuff, there'd be five or six of us rent. Right, but I'm hard to something of that nature for a long term lease. Yeah, and I understand. But or a, a house. But really, when you're in hotels, like you're referring to, probably to the past five or six of you in a hotel. This is for people actually living in this particular area. Oh, well, we, we lived in actual well, residential neighborhoods. Yeah. Okay. That's considered a long term lease. Six months. Per, per, per state law, it's over 30 days. You know, if you're having one of those little parties for the day, that's, a, that's one thing. But if something happens, we've had this long discussion here today as a, as a board to represent Carter County. Say next week, God forbid, something happens up there that's, that's really, that's really uh, tragic in terms of everything we hear going on in this country. If something happens tragic in that property, we better have all our. We we have all our we, we have all our our, our teeth crossed and, and eyes dotted. Uh, they are. Uh, that's uh, what uh, I'm uh, saying. And the only thing we can do other than this is have Josh address it. Is that they are doing nothing illegal. It does not matter who they lease any property to. There'd be no difference in anybody else. They're, they're, nobody tells you you have to do a background check on them. Is there a background check done on the members of the planning commission before they become planning commissioners? No, it wouldn't be a bad idea. Well, <laughs> but, there's no, but there is no law that says that. I understand that. The same thing with those in that house. All they're doing is leasing a house. Long term. Long term. 
So if they're not staying 30 days or over, then would that not be in violation? But, I but then again, again I don't know. How do we even know? Because if in that neighborhood, I would be. So if so if I have rental property and I rent a house and a tenant comes in and I have a long-term lease with them and they leave three weeks later, did I just violate state law as per transitional housing? I had a long-term lease with it. Something happened to got the, got the lease broken. A hotel would be considered, a hotel is, is, is temporary. You know, you, you, you lease it by the night. The uh, what do they call these houses now that everybody rents Airbnb. their house? Airbnb. Is Airbnb legal in Carter County? In the planning office, we do not have a valid answer for that. State law has addressed it and says that it is legal. So if you can, so if you can lease stuff temporarily for Airbnb then you can do it on other pieces of property. You just, you know, put that Airbnb name on it. The, uh, the, the worst thing with all this was, was, in my opinion, is we were given a whole lot of bad information. The, uh, the, the number of times it talks about sex offenders, you know, it talks about, you know, I've heard everything, that there's drug dealers there, and there's sex offenders, the sheriff has addressed that many times. Until a crime's committed, we can't go arrest people for not doing anything wrong. Just because someone went to prison and got out doesn't mean they can't live in anybody's neighborhood. I'm not saying I agree or disagree with that. I'm saying we have to, the only thing we can do is apply our laws to everybody either. Here's what I want. Make sure you can do this I'm going to have the county attorney here to answer the question. Yeah, I'll have, uh, I'll give the information to Josh and I, and then we'll be able to get the board panel set up. And, uh, who all went and why. Right. And that way, you'll have it. Right. But, so is this a business? Is it considered a business or a faith based ministry? Right. Well, what is it? It's a ministry. So it's, it's a ministry. It's not a business. It's a manual where they lease out to the student housing. And they don't have a business license. Don't get a business license to rent a real estate. So they don't have a business license. It's to, to, to rent that house, they don't need one. They don't. It's it's just just is there sufficient amount of information with this planning commission to where they can say there is no violation of our current regulations? That's exactly right, Mr. Johnson. This is where that can be issued to the county commission. No, or you cannot force things that we don't have room to yeah. now. You don't have a rule cut on what you've been discussing so far. So when you come up with a rule, what you're talking about, you're you still have that same thing. If you read the presentation of the material given by the complainant in this, they are just a lot of rules and regulations that are there. Well, I'm not saying that you can't do it. I'm just saying that there's no rule that says that you can't do it. Well, that's what I'm saying. I'm saying that oftentimes your residents are trying to bring civil problems to you for the remedy, which if we don't have a regulation, we have no authority. They have to take it to the civil court. But I let I let the county attorney here. Yeah. And we'll stop. With that, let's move on to uh, item number eight. Thank you, Jack. Can the report. There's two mistakes, and we just saved paper and didn't print. So I'll I'll note those as we go. Um, for July, we started a new fiscal year. We have written so far four residential new permits. Those total $5,463. We also did four additions, which were $1,958. We had seven detached accessories, which were $295. No pools, no modulars. Five manufactured, which totaled $175 three commercials, and one of these was a Dollar General, so that's why they're so high, $7,394. We did two agricultural permits. Those are free, so they were nothing. One stormwater, which was 75, four COs, which were 200. We did two 
tower upgrades, which were 1,000. We did 14 business license zonings, which was 70. We had 26 archive fees, and those totaled 130. That was one of the mistakes. Uh, we did 44 total permits written. And then we get down to our electric permits. We wrote 70. We kept 350 of that in the county. $4,805 went to the state. And then we totaled so far just this fiscal year, $17,110 was our grand total for the month. That was kept in-house. And kept in-house. Yes. And, and for July, that's huge. You know, I think last July we wrote like $2,800 or $3,400 worth of permits total. Uh, 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 <laughs> as, as far as that goes, you know, if you're looking at the rest of the year, you're looking at about two hundred four thousand dollars if we maintain this status. I don't think we will because we're going to hire some other special in there. Like uh, Mel said, it's pretty important to you. Uh, that will be referred to as the betting in dollar general. Next on the uh, agenda is Code Enforcement Officer's Report. <laughs> Mel, what'd you get? Now hit a button. Hold on. Here, I hit this for a minute. Abby, we need your assistance. It's on. Don't turn around. Okay. Okay. Just get it on the okay, ground. Okay, so it's got five. Oh, no, you turned it off. Where's the little flag? Here. Hey, Mr. Hayer. Is it? You have to plug How do you know? Okay. I have it right now. Oh, yeah. You have to plug it. I'll tell you what we'll do. I got this speech down and I got uh, this call. The prayer is not going to work. Thanks so much. Nick Bradley's in. Are you going to do it? Can we get up here a little bit? Are you ready? Yeah. I'll be more happy to work there. Right. Yeah, so we have it. Any last time? Are you sure? Thank you, D.P. Ready? Help us this technology. We are happy. It's over. We're ready. Okay, recent stop work orders that have been issued. 135 Sarah Annie Road. You see on the lower left hand picture, that's a single wide trailer that previously had had a, a roof built over it. We discussed that at the last Planning Commission meeting about the reasons on why you should not build a roof on a single wide trailer. So it's attached to the and, uh, Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so the guy decided he was going to build a three-story house behind it. <laughs> and I talked to him. He never got any permit or anything. And uh, if you look at the top left-hand corner, those are two by eight four joists. When me and Chris went down there and looked at this building, when we walked in on the floor, we both immediately spread apart because the floor was moving so much that we thought the floor was going to fall off. The uh, maximum distance you can span on a two by eight is 12 feet seven inches. He spanned at 19 feet nine inches. I could go in there at 295 pounds and jump up and down on the floor and break one of those floor joists. I guarantee I can break it. The, uh, he stood, he, the guy's going to come and get a permit. He's got to take one story off of it. He's got the, the first story is cantilevered on the foundation. You can only cantilever, uh, you can cantilever a maximum of, of one story. He's got to put, he's got to run beams through it. 
he laid some block that he laid part of the block he laid with you know with regular mortar like you're supposed to lay and poured, poured concrete in them and he has pictures of some stuff he did on the footers and uh, so these blocks he just stacked them up poured concrete down in them <laughs> so to say that's what we thought when we saw it. We laughed. I've got pictures where you can see through some of these cinder blocks. So, I called General Shell and talked to the, one of the top guys in charge and, and their lead engineer. And that method of, of stacking block and pouring concrete in it is legal. It makes code. So, so, so now that is a perfect example, and I'm glad y'all put this on here so we can talk about that. That is a perfect example of all we are expecting to is minimum code. I don't want anything built that way. I don't want anything that the county owns to be built that way. But if I go in to inspect it, all I can inspect to is that minimum code. It is legal per the minimum code. Encouraged? Definitely not. Uh, Next slide. 849 Pine Grove Road. This house had, it was on, it caught on fire and a uh, local construction company started working on it with no permit. We put a stop work, actually the, the way we found out they were working on it was electrician come in and get the electrical permit. Sitting in our office, he called the, the homeowner or the contractor one, I don't know which one, and told them that they had to come get a building permit. He didn't come and get one. So we took a stop work order and put on it. So then we doubled the cost of his permit. The, uh, the entire floor had to be taken out of it because of, it was built, the house was built in like 1939, I think. The floor was rotten. So they've got a permit on that. You know, the stop work order has been cleared. They're working on it. Next slide. Uh, 327 Happy Valley Road, that's right above Happy Valley Elementary School. The guy got a permit to remodel a house and put a addition on one side of it. They started working on the house and ended up completely rebuilding the entire, there, there's an entire brand new house there except for the foundation. Well, once he got past the point of doing the addition, he needed a building permit. When, we, when I went and looked at it, there were some pretty serious code issues in it. So that one is a perfect category of, of why a permit's required and why inspections are required. The, uh, the worst issue in that one was living space upstairs in the attic built into the rafters that they had a door going upstairs. If you come out of this door, there was less than 36 inch, minimum landing size was 36 inches. It was maybe 32 or 33 inches. When I turned to go beside where the, the wall, where, where the, the steps come up, I had to turn sideways to shimmy through the space. You know, no, nowhere near the proper head clearance. And then, you know, he's gonna have his kids up there running around. He got the proper permit on that and the stop work order has been cleared on it. Uh, 207 Lever's Lane, this is on the other side of the Baltimore River over here. It's, for lack of a better explanation, it's a soup sandwich. There's been so much, there, there's so many violations on there, we probably would run out of slides if we put them on it. The, uh, he got permits for storage buildings and then decided he was going to build rental cabins down on the edge of the river. That's a campground. Was not submitted to the Planning Commission for approval for a campground. The property's in a flood zone. If you look at the deck in the upper right hand corner, that deck is not properly fastened to the ground so that when, when the river floods, it holds it there. Uh, there's the stop work order placed on the door. They've got somebody living in it. No certificate of occupancy was issued. He has no valid septic permit but yet he has septic line, lines run to it. The, uh, he just wants to do all kinds of stuff over there. I finally wrote up, I've got, I think it's nine pages of, of violations and lines of violation. Next slide. 
And that's it for the stop work orders. And the first stormwater one for last month was 217 Toll Branch. Um, I mailed a letter, mailed another letter, never heard anything from them, went and posted a note on the door, and a woman came running out as we were pulling out and said that her landlord was trying to fix it. He called, said he was working on it, and um, it's still not much better. Um, so that one's probably going to have to go with a few others to work when we get those settled up. Um, the next one is 172 Hubert Shell Road. This one is actually right off of T-Berry where um, we have a violation. I think we took him a letter and he's, his civil penalty is like $5,200 because he just won't fix his driveway. The way, and this house borders it. So while we were up there talking to the guy on T-Berry, he said, well, this one is messed up. So I sent this guy a letter, super nice guy. Uh, he called, said he was going to have the bank hydro seated and he was going to have a culvert put in. Within, I want to say, a week and a half, the culvert was in. It's so much better. He's saving up the money to hydro seat it. It's going to be pretty expensive, but he's, he's in the process of working on that. Next. And then this one is 130 Creekside Drive. Uh, Jay had a call for some litter. And so, uh, and then uh, the neighbor said there was a junkyard being ran on this property, which there's not. But we see, it, this is zone residential. So we went up there, I sent the guy a letter, um, and the next day, I think he called and he told me that he had, um, he parked his school bus where the rock is, he drives a school bus, he seated it, he's got straw, it looks great. So he's, he's fixed and he's up to code. Now, um, last month Jerry asked uh, how many property violations as far as litter, go, litter code goes that I've had and how many have cleaned up. I shot from the head the percentage of about 40 and he asked for exact numbers. So here are my exact numbers. From February, is when, I, when I started working here, actually probably early March of last year, 2018 violations sent. I had 150 total properties that I sent a letter to. 85 of those are now in compliance. 42 are either they're not compliant but they're working with me and i'm working on them as well and 22 need remediation and those are the ones we voted on for court that'll go as we get them rolling um, these are also things that i inherited as well I, i'm going to take credit for all of them but they're not all mine this year i've had 161 total properties that i've sent violation letters to 83 have come in compliance 64 are working or i'm working on them and they're or, and they're not compliant 14 need remediation as far as probably the one in court uh, so grand total in the last two years 311 total complaints 168 have become compliant 106 were working and there's 36 that are probably going to end up going to court now but um, not included in those are ones that have gone to court which is 16 total um, two of which are completely clean and in compliance, the other ones are becoming in compliance through court order. So as far as percentages go, 54% of, of them are in compliance, 34 working on it, and then 11 need more uh, remediation. Here's some just pictures of things we've seen. You know, it's a junkyard, uh, 127 Creekside, that's where we saw the, the stormwater issue as well. They've, removed most of those vehicles, if not all of them. Siam Road, I, there's a house there, somewhere. Uh, this one out here on Hamilton Road, just mini dump. Um, we had a, a vacant and dilapidated house here on Siam that we're working on as well. And these are all from this month, so obviously I'll be going back. I've spoken with this individual who said he's worked extensively, so we'll be visiting him again pretty soon at the end of this month. Um, Sheets Hollow had a couple. This one just has a bunch of mess on the front porch there. Ruby Avenue, I don't know what happened here or if we ever found out. I mean, it's been cleaned, but we don't know why it got this way. It's like the house just vomited. 
in the front yard. <laughs> Must have been at that party Mel was talking about. <laughs> Garrison Hollow, this one had a, uh, it was an illegal structure placed in the front yard of the house. We got that remediated. Uh, he came in and got a permit, and we also wanted underpinning on the single wide, which he, which he fixed. Troy Pierce Road had, this is an actual trailer park, so we had several that we took pictures of, and she's working with us to get those resolved. Um, Mel found this one when he was deer hunting. I don't actually, I have no idea what he was doing. He just found that one at that uh, So we have that one on Bailey Lane. Old Stony Creek Road had an issue with, it's been there for a long time. We're trying to get it uh, remedied as well. And that is, yeah. And next month I'll try to have more as far as how these court cases have unfolded and what the judges have. Thank you, Jay. What the
Yeah, I've got a lot to share, and I'm tired of trying to do it. I hate training. But anyway, but I'll have that information. We'll see what we can do next time. I'll give you that. Some type of plan. Like I said, we can turn in and say, hey, here's, here's where we're going. Here's what we're going to do. Mm -hmm. All right. Anybody got anything? Uh, next on the uh, director's report, uh, one key thing on Never Howard County suit as far as the planning department, uh, and I never intend to. Uh, the meeting and the situation the other night, and I wish the press wouldn't have left yet. Uh, They're doing a live report in the hallway. Well, anyways, you know, they never asked me. They asked Miss Color, and they didn't give all the whole information. I think they asked, uh, asked Dr. Aiko. I think they discussed with the, the mayor. But as myself and Mr. Becca and Mr. Goodall walked out of the room, which we stayed there long after anyone else, uh, they went shining the camera at Mr. Goodall. And I think he discussed it with him after I separated and went off the other way, which nobody ever asked me what was going on. So I probably could have uh, ended that little situation of uh, me uh, and was satisfied with him. But anyways, I will say that Mr. Johnson was not in that meeting. <laughs> and I want to publicly state that. Uh, and there was nothing that would uh, relate as far as the, the sun, sunshine model. So uh, with that said, that's all I have. We have no public boards. And the next item on the agenda is... I've got a quick question. I want to stop doing my job if I'm not asking this question. When did this board vote? Get a $14,000 That was in, uh, I've got the minutes. I don't remember those. Maybe, and I, I make mistakes all the time. It was the, uh, it was the, uh, it's not the vote, it was, that's what, it was the vote. When did we have it right now? Yes. Uh, uh, yes. So we voted on it as this committee to get, for the uh, chairman to write a letter to give a $14,000 You don't have to, you voted to pay for the vote. Yes. So we voted for it. Yes. Yeah. 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 Yeah